The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! And hello and welcome into Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tyson, my partner, Malik Hill. And we're now into May. Another month going away. NFL draft completely over. We're going to go over that today. NBA playoffs are in the second round. And so there's a lot to talk about. And right off the bat, we got some MSU news for once. MSU is a part of the transfer portal and not in a good way. Uh, Michigan State football is losing quarterback Peyton Thorne and wide receiver Keon Coleman to the transfer portal. It's pretty devastating, to be honest. Um, yes, there's a lot of people that are kind of iffy on Peyton Thorne. They didn't know if they liked him or didn't. There's a lot of hype behind some of the other guys, uh, like Noah Kim. Sure, whatever. Um... The bigger loss definitely probably is Keon Coleman because he's just a big bodied receiver. He was supposed to make up for Jaden losing Jaden Reed to the draft, and he was going to be the next big thing, I would say, uh, for this yeah, offense. He was probably going to be picked in the first three rounds of the draft because yeah. the, his stats would have been there. Yeah. And uh, now he he's still, gone. He still might be yeah. wherever he goes. He's, he, yeah. he, he might move up around, honestly. Um, depending on where it goes, so it it's a wait and see, but it's it's definitely very disappointing to lose uh not only now Jaden Reed to the draft, but now Peyton Thorne and Keon Coleman, two big parts of the offense. I think they're in trouble. <laughs> and they're slowly becoming um a distaste, I would say, for Mel Tucker. Uh, among MSU fans, so it all goes from you know we're riding high on the roller coaster and Tuck we've, coming. We've already uh, we've already gone down the roller coaster and uh, it's almost over apparently. Um, people aren't liking the money deal now, even though they were in love with getting him paid at one point. It's weird. I don't get it. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of big question marks for the MSU team this season, and uh, it's not looking good. It's not looking good. You have any other takeaways on this uh, little tidbit? Uh, first, as a Michigan fan, it is sad and also hilarious to me. Unfortunately, uh, yeah, just just seeing MSU fans go from so high to so low, and there be like no middle ground. I haven't seen much of a middle ground from MSU fans right now. Maybe yeah. I've just seen the reactive takes, but yeah, people are either it, it's just all over the place, right? But, yeah, it's uh, losing Keon Coleman to the big one. Mm-hmm. Peyton Thorne, a lot of MSU fans were okay to see him go. Yeah. A lot of fans were happy to see him go. Some people are all, like, fully on the Noah Kim train. Mm-hmm. They also have Caden Hauser, who came in as a four-star last year. But, yeah, it, Peyton Thorne was, like, a leader of the team. Yeah. So it's not like that would have been easy to replace. Like, he's been the guy for the past three years. Right. He was there when they hit their highest peak. Mm-hmm. And like we said, Keon Coleman, he's he's the most talented player on the offense. Yeah. And yeah, now you're going to have to rely a bunch on Antonio Gates Jr., who's highly recruited but super young. Yep. Trey Mosley, does he become the number one? Because he's more of like a number two guy. Right. There, there are a lot of questions yeah. that have to be answered now with these two gone. Even if MSU fans are somewhat happy that Peyton Thorne, that doesn't mean the quarterback issue was solved. Right. I mean, you you knew what you were getting out of Peyton Thorne, mm-hmm. which was good and bad. Now you, it's just completely up in the air. Yeah, but we'll see. Maybe maybe there's something good out of it, but it's not looking good at the moment. Yeah, that the the 2022 was it the 2022 recruiting class or this just or this one in 2023 that was like highly rated and 
got the fans excited. Um, Whichever one, the, that recruiting class is what they're hanging on to right now. Yeah. Because there are several mm-hmm. high four-star guys, some real talent that Mel Tucker brought in, but they're freshmen and sophomores. Right. So how much can you rely on them in the Big Ten? Still got a lot to develop. Yeah. All righty. NFL draft is over. We've been able to stew on what happened. Uh, the Lions did some things. Um, we'll talk about that. And uh, just as always, our mock draft got blown up. No surprise. Yeah. Um, we got we, the, we we got a lot of the players that were in there. We got the second. The ordering. <laughs> we got the second, third, fourth pick right. Um, and that honestly might be all we got right. Listen, uh, I've yeah. I I have my takeaway but it's fun. is that I I got Devin Witherspoon almost top 5. Mm-hmm. Almost hit that one. Yeah. I mean, I I had him at the 7th pick, I mean, and he went top 5, which was kind of a shocker, but yeah, yeah I got him in the top 10. Mhm. Um Paris Johnson went outside the top. Well, wait, he didn't go outside. He went at 9, didn't No, he? yeah, he went um cuz the Cardinals traded yeah. back in to get him. Yeah, they traded back in, and they got him at the sixth pick, actually. Yeah, which is higher where I had him at Yeah, because they used the Lions pick to take him. Yeah. And then they uh, traded back in somewhere else. Maybe it was later, but yeah. So they traded out of the third. Listen, we were a pick away on Dalton Kincaid. Yeah. We had him at 28. He went. Where did he go? Did he go 27? He went 20. No, he went uh, 25th. Cause, okay, yeah, he went 25th. Because they traded up. Because the Bills thought that uh, Cowboys were going to take him. Yeah, we our our sense, our thoughts on these things made a lot of sense. Oh, like, we, I had the Steelers taking Darnell right. Uh, and you did get he went Brian, to Chicago instead. You got Brian Brise right. I did. Going to New Orleans. Yes, I got Brian Brise. I did okay. <laughs> I, I did all right. I'm happy with it. So we got a couple close. We got a couple that we got right. Yeah. We knew Bijan was going to go higher. Yeah. At the end, we said that. But we knew it would be wild either way. Um, One thing nobody could predict was Will McDonald, 15th overall t- yeah. to the Jets. Anyway, um, what are your overall takeaways of the draft? Just off the top of your head, no particular team or anything. Um. What kind of stood out to you in this draft? So the first thing was seeing the Will Levis drop. Uh, Us two weren't big Will Levis fans. Mm -hmm. And we, I think you, you actually, you you thought the Patriots were going to trade up to get him. I just. Yeah, that was just kind of my bold take. But I thought that if, if he fell out of the top 10, they felt like the last team that would have a chance to take him. Once he got past that pick, basically, because I was pretty sold that Washington wasn't going to take him. After that point, I was pretty positive he would drop out of the first round. Yeah, uh, I am a big fan of what Seattle did in the first few rounds. Devin Witherspoon, getting him and JSN in the first round, Mm -hmm. you've got two guys that are like maybe pro bowlers for years to come. Yeah. And your your secondary is a problem. Mm -hmm. If Devin Witherspoon hits like I think he should. Derek Hall in the second round out of Auburn was good. Zach Charbonnet. Some people think the pick was weird. I personally love it. I think you, it is. you cannot you cannot go along anymore with one back getting like thirty carries a game. Yeah. Like Derrick Henry is like the last one left. I do you think need it's two weird. guys. I do think it's a little bit weird. Do you think they should have gotten another type of running back, but a different type of running back? Um You you need two. You need at least two. I just felt like maybe like what? Charbonnet was a third round pick? Uh yes. No, so second round pick. See the twenty first pick in the second round. Yeah, like it just felt like a lot of capital for Seattle to pay that. Um, which I don't know. Maybe does that say something about Ken Walker's game that they're saying he's lacking something to bring in a a guy that's one of the top backs of this draft class? I, I, don't, I honestly it's don't just, think so. I I think Zach Charbonnet is going to keep Kenneth Walker healthy. That's what I think. All like the super tough, like the tough yards and the goal line carries. Those are going to Zach Charbonnet. Mm-hmm. He's a bigger back. He's a guy that likes to run between the tackles. And Kenneth Walker is going to be more of a weapon out of the backfield. And yeah. that is a big asset in today in today's game to take some pressure off of your star running back. Who do you think is the pass catching back though for that that duo? Honestly, Kenneth Walker. 
You think so? Yeah. I, you could have some sets where you have, like, all receive well, like, Kenneth Walker out as a receiver and Charbonnet in the backfield. I know that's what Pete Carroll wants, but I don't know. Like, we didn't see a ton from Ken Walker um, previously that he can have that elite ability to catch the ball in the backfield. So you also have both of them in the game at the yeah, in the same backfield. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a wait it's and see, but it, to me, it was just a little bit surprising that not, not only did they take Jackson Smith and Jigba to pair with Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf, which just, I mean, it's a lot of depth, but it makes it so somebody's basically going to lose a lot of touches. And then same thing with the running backs, where they're like really deep now, but I'm just, I'm, I'm curious how the rotation works. I, I'm, I'm not saying that it's necessarily a bad thing, but it just felt like they could have maybe waited and taken a different running back. With, with the JSN thing, I, as long as they're winning, I don't think Tyler yeah. Lockett and DK Metcalf are, are veterans at this point. Like they, they know, they know what it takes yeah. to win. I think the JSN is like a an insurance policy policy for Tyler Lockett because he's starting to get up there in age. And they're going to start him off in the in the slot. Yeah. Or they're Tyler Lockett can play either way. Mm-hmm. JSN will start in the slot. Right. So, but, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, Seattle also took two Michigan guys back-to-back, back, and I love that. Mike Morris and Olu Oluwatimi. Yeah. Yeah. They should both be decent, at least. Olu is a really good center. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Let's talk about the Lions. Lions going into the draft. They had pick number six, and they had pick 18. They traded pick six. Yeah. And we were all holding our breath. They traded with the Cardinals. They moved back to 12 because the Cardinals had traded with Houston to. So Houston got to move back into the third spot. So they got pick two and three. So then the Cardinals went down to 12. And then Lions traded with the Cardinals to go to 12, which was a big shock to me because Jalen Carter was sitting there primed and ready. That's who I wanted, personally. Um, and it was not who the Lions wanted. And apparently it was not. It was yeah. not. Um, so they got 12, and then uh, with 12, they got um, 34. So early second-round pick. So I was thinking, okay, this is perfect. We can now take you know, our top linebacker, because we had said for a while that Jack Campbell or Drew Sanders we should use with the 48th pick. But we didn't think that they would – they could have gone before 48. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, maybe Jalen Carter keeps dropping. Maybe they get him at 12. That also was not the case. Um, Jalen Carter went 10 to Philadelphia. So then I was like, okay, Nolan Smith is there. Nolan Smith, high energy guy. Yes, he's very raw, but we have potential here. And they pass on him as well and who they take is Jameer Gibbs the number two running back in the class and everybody anywhere is shocked the NFL is shocked every other team is shocked Lions fans are shocked Detroit radio is shocked I was listening to 97.1 they covered the uh, draft on Twitch and so I was watching that um, because I like to hear their take from it, and I usually just mute the ESPN draft. Um, and they were just going crazy because they did not understand it. And we all know Mike Lenny doesn't like running backs in the first round. Fair enough. And I just sat there and stewed for a while, even though the lines were coming back up to 18 um, in just a few picks. But after the shock and realizing that it happened, I was thinking, okay, at 18, we can still get anybody. People are dropping. Nolan Smith is still dropping. Uh, Maybe there's a chance for Christian Gonzalez. Quentin Johnston is there, who I had uh, picked for the Lions to take. Kalijah Kansi, who was heavily mocked to the Lions at 18, all over the place. Um, But while I was waiting for that, I was kind of analyzing the Jameer Gibbs thing. Almost immediately figured... There's no way DeAndre Swift is on this team through the end of the weekend. Um, And that ended up coming to fruition, Uh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And 
I just, that was like the biggest moment, I think, for Lions fans to say, in Brad, we trust. We all said it before the draft that we're going to trust whatever Brad Holmes does. And they go out and shock the world taking Jameer Gibbs. Now, some people do think that he could be better than Bijan Robinson. And now I'm curious how the roles will fit with him and David Montgomery. I think they can do the same thing that they did last year. Basically thinking of it through the positive is Jameer Gibbs will be possibly better than DeAndre Swift and David Montgomery being an upgrade of Jamal Williams. And I'm hoping that's how they kind of use him. Jameer Gibbs is a guy that they can use out of the slot. He can catch the ball. And like we said before, we know that Jameson Williams is going to be out for six weeks. So hopefully he adds that dynamic part of the offense. He realistically could be the number two receiver behind Amon Ross St. Brown in this offense, potentially, depending on how he worked. Um, But I I still don't know how to feel about the pick because there were so many good defensive options. And I was so set that once we moved back, I was like, okay, that means we're we're dead set on doing something to get more defense. And it didn't happen. So uh yeah. What was your what were your thoughts when you saw Jameer Gibbs on the TV screen? I was definitely shocked. I uh, I think it didn't take as long for me to know how good of I think because I know he's going to be productive. I don't know why I'm kind of like turning in my head right now about it. Man, it, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's really tough. It is really tough, like you said, because he's very talented. And then you you go through all the stuff where they tell you don't take running backs in the first round. Mm-hmm. It's bad value. You shouldn't do it. At the end of the day, I like Jameer Gibbs, and I've liked him for the past three years that he's been in college. Yeah. And I think he's a phenomenal talent. And they got a phenomenal talent. Mm-hmm. You know what? I, yeah, according to a lot of people, the positional value was terrible. Yeah. You got a guy that's going to be good as long as he's healthy for a long time. Mm-hmm. I, I'm starting to agree with what a lot of people are saying, though, recently, is that this draft definitely proved just don't listen to mock drafts. They don't matter. They're not NFL guys. They're not in the the war rooms with these guys. They don't know who's on who's big board. They're just going off of what everybody else knows, that this team needs some of these needs, and this is maybe guys that they're looking at. But at the end of the day, you never fully know. And the Lions said at one point that they, they would have taken Gibbs at six. Now, that would have been a shock. <laughs> uh, people would have been real up in arms because yeah. I'm, I'm sure at six – I would have much, personally too, I would have much rather had Bijan Robinson just because I feel like there's a little bit better known quantity there. Um, but they ended up taking Jameer Gibbs. Hopefully it works out. The only problem too with that is now with that high draft capital is that if he doesn't work out, there's going to be a lot of booze. There's going to be a lot of noise about it. And it might take him a little bit to get going. So I'm not going to try to count him out uh, right away or anything, but it is going to be a little bit questionable. So then we moved to 18. Christian Gonzalez just got taken. Uh, kind of felt like he was stolen from us again, similar to Devin Witherspoon at five. Um, a lot of people thought the Lions were going to take a cornerback. So then I thought, all right, this lines up perfectly with Kalijah Kansi. I'm ready to take him. Or Nolan Smith. I was okay with Nolan Smith too. And we took Jack Campbell at 18. Again, one of the best players at his position in this draft. The weirdest part for me is I go back to thinking, I don't remember exactly where it was, but hearing that Brad Holmes doesn't like to take linebackers early in draft because he knows like what he's looking for in a linebacker so that he takes them later. So now that makes me feel like Jack Campbell, like ha- he has to be a home run. Um, because most people thought he would be a second round guy like like Drew Sanders. Those are two top linebackers, but everybody thought you could get them in the second round just because of their position. And that position is not valued very highly. So in terms of 
positional value and things. The Lions are doing terrible in their first two picks. And we have a whole day that we have to sit on this. And throughout the night, I was kind of just like, I, I wasn't fully bummed out because I saw that Nolan Smith kept dropping. He ends up going to the Eagles at 30. So obviously there's something that every team is struggling behind with Nolan Smith. The one that did hurt was Kalaj Kansi went right after to Tampa Bay, and they seemed pretty quick about that pick. Um, and that always makes me feel a little bit nervous. Um, so I like the Jack Campbell pick, but again, when you thought you could have probably still got him at 34, it just makes it a little upsetting because then I think you could have had like Kalijah Kansi and Jack Campbell, but that's just me. How did you feel about when they got Jack Campbell at 18? This is one, as soon as they made the pick, I was in. Yeah. I I've I know been, there are some big Jack Campbell fans. I've been in on Jack Campbell since I started watching more of his highlights and his tape from games in the past month or so. Mm-hmm. His size, he's 6'5", 250. He graded out as a high-level athlete. On tape, he doesn't play as fast as he did run his 40, but he still plays really quick. Mm-hmm. He has high instincts. He's to me. He's just everything you want in a middle linebacker. Mm-hmm. He has everything you want, and he is going to be like the leader of the defense probably at some point. Yeah, I I think Jack Campbell is a key piece to what this team is mm-hmm. and what that defense is going to be. And I yeah, I just think he's going to be a high level linebacker for a long time. Yeah. Now so if, yeah, if he comes out like his grades, his his grading comes out to comparisons of Luke Keekley. Now, if he becomes Luke yeah, Keekley, and surprise, surprise, he's he just worked with Luke Keekley. Yeah, in the off season, he's been working with them. Right. So if he if he turns into Luke Keekley, I don't care. They that means it's the ultimate slam dunk. <laughs> they could have taken him at ten yeah. or twelve or whatever. Uh, I wouldn't care. Yeah, I'm not saying he's Luke Keekley, but right. he's super talented and a really mm. good football player. Yeah. So day one, Lions fans are in shambles. We're confused. We're not. We're definitely more in the mood of. Your parents aren't mad. They're disappointed. Yeah. That's kind of how we felt. Um, and that yeah. kind of went away in day two because this is kind of where Brad Holmes has been known to make his money, and he kind of kept doing it. But to start off round two, he, he played with the fans a little bit. Every, everybody, everybody figured they were going to take a tight end. Yes. Eventually. And everybody was super happy we didn't take a tight end at 18. We didn't fall into that trap. That would have made Lions fans real mad. So then at pick number three in the second round, Michael Mayer fell all the way there. Everybody's like, okay, I guess we're taking Michael Mayer. And the Lions once again threw a 180 at us, and they took Sam Laporta. Didn't really shock me. No, and I'm not mad about it because in our mock, we had Sam Laporta as the second tight end off the board. Now, that was my pick. I had him going to Philadelphia. I liked him uh, just a little bit more than Mayer. Um, but it just was it was interesting because a lot of people really liked Michael Mayer. Um, some of us felt like Sam Laporta was a little underrated. I think that he can possibly also evolve into more of a pass catcher than he, he was even in college. Um, I think the Lions, the way they use the tight end, is going to help him a lot that they kind of throw him yeah. all over the place. Whenever he got the ball at Iowa, he made plays, but mm-hmm. their quarterback situation was just so terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So second round is starting to look up. Then they still have that other pick that they had before um, at 48, and they traded up Yeah. Uh, to the 14th pick, which I can't remember exactly is what exactly it was. Um, it would have been like, um, 43 or something like that. Something around there. Um, and they end up taking Brian Branch, who a lot of people thought could have been a first-round talent. Um, best safety in the class. A lot of people thought that Green Bay was going to take a safety, and the Lions traded with Green Bay to get this pick. And they took Brian Branch, which I thought was a home-run hitting uh, pick. Yeah, Because now, when you start to stack this, this draft up, you have Jameer Gibbs, 
potentially the number two running back in the class. Jack Campbell, the one or two linebacker in the class. Brian Branch, the top safety in the class. Sam Laporta, kind of all over the place for tight end, depending on how you view him. His talent is top three. Right. Um, and so Brian Branch, I think all of a sudden everybody was like, okay, we're back yeah. on board with this draft. At that point, there were a bunch of people on Twitter that were saying, like, you rearrange these picks, yes. and, it's a, and it's an A for the Lions. Right. Um, so we're getting back on track. So then we get to the third round. People are starting to feel good again. We got the fifth pick in the third round. And this was kind of a surprise, but I I like it a lot, actually. Hendon Hooker, your guy. Coming off the ACL, he gets to sit behind Jared Goff. He's a veteran backup, basically, because of all the time that he spent in college. Yeah. One of the older players in the draft. Um, and he just... he. There's not pressure on him to get in the game and start playing. We're already in contract negotiations with Goff, so if by chance they fall through or Goff doesn't perform this year, Hennon Hooker might be the next guy sooner rather than later. Um, and then just if Goff gets hurt, like we have a more solidified guy that can step in, hopefully. Uh, we don't have to worry about Nate Sudfeld, even though I think Nate Sudfeld is okay. He's he's way better than David Blau and all those guys that we yeah. used to have. If there was a con- like a quarterback controversy going into next season, mm-hmm. I think Lions fans would be more excited than worried. Yeah, because that that would mean Hendon Hooker could potentially be like special, right? And you got to think before his injury, Hendon Hooker was possibly going to be a first round pick, yeah. and depending on you know how things played out, he could have been one of those top three quarterbacks in the draft. Uh, so I think there's a lot of value that they made up here. And then at uh, 33 in the third round, they took Broderick Martin out of Western Kentucky. Now, I didn't know much about him going into it, um, but everything that I've heard has been positive. People are saying that that is a steal of a pick um, at where they got him. And uh, if it's a need, we needed a defensive tackle. Yeah. Listen, uh, if you just watch a few clips of him, and look at how big he is. Yes. He's 6'5", 335. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, he is ridiculously huge. Right. And, yeah, you figure he's just going to be their nose tackle. Right. For a long time. Just, and the nice know, thing is. Swallowing up the run game. When you think about it, too, like, everybody talks about Jalen Carter not being, like, a sacks guy. Filling up space. Roderick, Roderick Martin is huge, and he will fill up space. Yeah. Um, he's also not, like, a huge. He's not going to, like close out and sack a quarterback quickly or anything, but he's just solid. And that's that's what we need. Um, then we finished out our draft. We had one fifth round pick. We took Colby Sorsdale, a tackle out of William and Mary. Uh, don't know much about him, but Yeah, I honestly have to do more research. I didn't look into Colby Sorsdale much. Yeah. He was um, a five year starter at William and Mary and was a team captain. So Yeah. People say he's yeah. he's pretty solid um for that Type of pick, and then our last pick. I like the, the seventh round pick. I, like I think it was good too. Um, yeah. and I knew that the name was familiar. I was like, didn't he play for UNC? And yes, we took Antoine Green out of UNC. Um, just a solid receiver, six two, two hundred pounds. Yeah. I think with Quintez Cephas, even though he didn't play much, mm-hmm. with him getting kicked off the team, I think this is a better replacement. Yeah, yeah. Like he he has real talent. He had a connection with Drake May who's going to be a top three pick in the draft next year probably. Mm-hmm. He could probably get a roster spot because he can. he's pretty good. Yeah. Um. So with the entire Lions draft, where do you grade it? I think that's the weird – that's the hardest part for a lot of people. I'll give them a B plus. Okay. I'll give them a B plus. Mostly, I think the Broderick Martin and Colby Sorsdahl picks, mm-hmm. I was like fully in with what the Lions were doing, and then those picks happened, and they were such unknowns to me that I was kind of like, uh, like they could have gone for stronger guys with like more, mm-hmm. not maybe not like more of a name, but like that have produced on a higher level. Yeah, but we we have to see how they play to right. s- see how it really works out. But yeah, the ending Antoine Green pick. I like that enough to take it from a B to a B plus because, yeah, those first four picks they made in the first and second round, yeah, from a positional value standpoint, it's not amazing. 
Yeah. But you switch them around, and it is a really good class of young players. Yeah. That are all that will all most likely be productive. Yeah. And for me, I think I'm like a B minus, but I'm trending upward. Uh as it's been sitting in my mind these last few days, I've come to more terms of it, but it's it's a lot of wait and see for me. Like Jameer Gibbs is a big wait and see. Sam Laporta is a big wait and see. Hendon Hooker obviously is a wait and see. Broderick Martin. Um, they're all all guys that I just think on paper look really good, but because they used that capital, especially on Jameer Gibbs and Jack Campbell. I'm a little more optimistic about Jack, Jack Campbell, um, but I just can't. It's hard to give them a full, like, good grade when there's a lot of moving pieces here. Um, I think my favorite pick, like a lot of people probably, is the Brian Branch pick. Our secondary basically goes to from the worst. They're too the deep in almost year. every position. Yeah, they are one of the in deepest the and possibly could be one of the best secondaries in the NFL. Yeah. Uh, again, as long as everything goes right, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're automatically the best, but they made so many moves, uh, so many good moves that their secondary could be really good. And that would really help out the defensive line. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's still exciting for the lines. I think they came out with an exciting draft. Jameer Gibbs could be a very flashy, exciting guy to watch. And, uh, We'll just have to, like I said, we'll have to wait and see. But um, for now, I'm not, I'm not like mad at it. I'm not even disappointed anymore. I don't think. Um, it's just kind of a, we'll have to see how it works out. And I know that people don't like when you kind of say that, and we're like, oh, you just wait and see. And they want a definitive answer, but it really is. It, it, there, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, okay. Any, let's do winners and losers. Who do you think won this draft, or who in your mind had the best draft, so to speak? Well, overall, I'd have to say the Philadelphia Bulldogs. <laughs> they, well, th- this plan that they have come up with, this is the first time I've ever seen something yeah, like this. Yeah, it's and it if this works, other teams will try to replicate it. Yeah, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> At first, I thought it was kind of a joke, and then they just ripped off every Georgia player possible Jalen Carter Nolan Smith Kelly Kaylee Ringo you trade for DeAndre Swift from the yeah. Lions mm-hmm. like there's a good chance this could work out and like be a big reason why they <laughs> won a Super Bowl and that is absolutely crazy like Philadelphia's Georgia plan yeah is different and I think not to mention yeah, that they they still already have Jordan Davis and N'Kobe Dean on yeah. the roster from last year yeah I, I also I love what Indianapolis did with their first three picks. Mm-hmm. Anthony Richardson, you get corner Julian Brents from Kansas State, long corner, and then Josh Downs from North Carolina, mm-hmm. who I said when we were previewing receivers, Josh Downs is only 5'10", maybe 5'9", at best. Yeah. And he had a better contested catch rate than Quentin Johnston, who's 6'4". Mm-hmm. He is a really good receiver, super quick, super fast, really good route runner with good hands. He's just small. And I think he should be productive in the NFL because of how much skill he has. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I liked what they did a lot. I think my favorite, because it's the style that I like, I like what Houston did. They said. They're trading up and getting two and threes. They said. Forget, that was a big shocker. Forget the rest of our picks. We're taking who we think is one of the best quarterbacks in the draft and the deep, best defensive player. They got C.J. Stroud. Traded back in to the first, like right after to Will Anderson. And they just put it all on the line. And I like that kind of strategy. Um, They didn't do a whole lot with the rest of their picks. I think getting Tank Dell, getting Xavier Hutchinson in the sixth round is crazy to me. Yeah. He blew up the senior bowl and had a lot of hype. Mm -hmm. Those are two quality receivers that you add to a young receiving core that's getting better. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like it's like I said before with Houston, um, when we did our mock draft, like, why not get aggressive? You know that your top few picks, they're not going to make a world of difference in one season. Like, I can imagine Houston being right back in there in the top five next year. Unless C.J. Stroud does something crazy. Um, 
I would assume Houston's going to be right back in the top 10. Possibly the top five. And they can do this all over again. Um, so I just like when teams get really, really aggressive. Um, How do you feel about Stetson Bennett to the Rams? It's kind of funny. Um, I think it's a good move. I mean, they're they're going to need a Matthew Stafford replacement. And getting him in the fourth round, I mean, I don't think there's a huge loss at taking him there. And it gives you an option. And you can see where he develops. But then at the same time, like if uh, somebody gets hurt again and the Rams are right back in the bottom, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't hate it. I think it's it's solid. They're they're gonna need somebody at some point. Um, what was the other one? Oh, I really liked the uh, the Devin A chain pick by Miami because it just fits their mold. Oh, you just speed on top of speed. Yeah, got him in the third round. They have aging running backs with Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson, but Raheem Mostert is very similar to a uh, Devon A chain. Um, so I kind of like their draft even though they didn't really have any picks. Yeah, one one more for me. I got the Brian Brzee pick right, so that's awesome. <laughs> but then the Saints took Kendra Miller in the third round. Mm-hmm. Really underrated running back prospect in this draft. I think he'll be really good for the Saints. Yeah. I love getting Jake Hayner in the fourth round. Mm. I think he is he's more than like a Gardner Minshew. I think he's a guy that can actually start and like be a quality player in the league mm-hmm. in the right position. Because he, he's a really good quarterback. And then A.T. Perry, I can't believe he lasted to the sixth round. Yeah, that's true. Like, if, if he pops, he's going to be really good for the Saints. Because mm-hmm. he's like 6'5", like 205, and honestly plays like a smaller receiver. Yeah. He has a lot of skill. What's your uh, what's your opinion on the Tennessee draft? Because that one's interesting to me. They take Peter Skaronsky at 11, which I think is a good value. Yeah. They trade up and get Will Levis, who a lot of people thought they were going to have to trade up for at 11. And I like I like Tajay Spears out of Tulane. I do too. Um, like for what they had, I feel like they did a pretty good, decent job. It was a yeah, pretty solid. Yeah, yeah solid. I give it like a B. Um, on the flip side, who had a bad draft? See, that's a tough one for me. I'm I'm not really good at like identifying who has a bad draft because we, we we really don't know until right they start playing. But let's see. When you just look, I think the Cardinals draft was solid. Mm-hmm. I don't think it was anything special. Like, Michael Williams, that was a good pick in the third round. Yeah. Garrett Williams, okay. B.J. Ojolari, I don't know if he'll turn out to be like a star. Clayton Toon in the fifth, I don't know if he'll ever play. Yeah. Because there are a lot of people thinking they could get the top pick next year and get Caleb Williams. So maybe he's just a stock for a backup. Do you... Do you hate Dallas's draft because they took two Michigan guys and your guy Deuce Vaughn? I have to. It hurts my heart that I like their draft. <laughs> Mozzie Smith, Luke Schoonmaker. I was a fan of DeMar- DeMarvian Overshone from Texas. They took him in the third round, mm-hmm. and they took my boy Deuce Vaughn. Yeah, yeah. It. It. I need to see him actually play because if it's more like a novelty pick because his dad works in the organization, mm-hmm. that'll make me kind of upset. Yeah. Deuce Vaughn can play. I want to see him get some touches. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, seeing that star on his helmet, that'll be tough. Yeah. That'll be pretty tough. Um, I You know, originally I was going to really not like the Packers draft, but they ended up getting Jaden Reed in the second round. And I feel like they kind of made up for it. They also that. they got Lou Nichols from Central Michigan. Mm-hmm. Who knows if he'll play, but he's really talented. Right. And I think Grant Dubos, Grant Dubos mm-hmm. from Charlotte in the seventh round is an underrated pick. Yeah. He's a guy that could have transferred to a bigger school, but he stayed at Charlotte. Mm-hmm. He's a really talented receiver. Yeah. Um Yeah, I guess I don't really have too many like bad drafts either. Now that I think about it. Yeah, maybe like maybe let me see before I say their name. I think I the, think Cleveland's draft was very average. Yeah. That's kinda, I'd, give, I'd give Cleveland like a C plus maybe. That's kind of how I feel about the Jets. I kind of mentioned it earlier with Will McDonald at 15. Just felt weird. Um, I like Will McDonald a lot. So even though it, it was a bit of a reach, I think Joe Tipman was a great second round pick. I think Israel Abanacanda, I think he could be really good for them. Yeah. I like that pick a lot too. Um, 
Any other surprises you want to mention real quick? Or I was surprised Darnell Washington fell to the third round. Yeah. And Pittsburgh got him for a second tight end, which could be really big for them. Here's another one that I think um, could actually be more meaningful than we first think. Tank Bigsby. You were a big proponent of him. Where did he go again? He went to Jacksonville in the third oh, round. Oh, yeah. Great, excellent pick. As much as, as much as people are on Travis Etienne, we saw Jacksonville not use Etienne as much as we thought. There's a chance that they could become a duo, and Tank Bigsby takes over a lot of the, the running down plays. He's going to get a lot of those in between the tackle carries. Yeah. And He's he going to get look, most of those, honestly. He can be your short yardage guy, yeah. your touchdown guy. And he has explosions, so he can break them. So I think he could he could play a lot more than people might expect. Right, I out expect. The gate. I think he's going to be the number two from the jump, probably. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a fun one. A lot of the running backs in this class, like, yeah, went to a deep running back class. went to like pseudo bad spots because it's like a busy backfield, but at the same time, like, could be really good. Uh, one two punch. Um, Baltimore getting Zay Flowers was fantastic. Uh, as a Baltimore fan, Buffalo getting Dalton Kincaid was terrifying. Um, that was one of those picks where it feels like the rich get richer, um, because I know that they'll be able to use both Kincaid and Dawson Knox at different points. Yeah. Um, similar to a guy like uh, I'm glad though. The one thing I'll say is Kansas City didn't feel like they. Blew people away like they did last year. They, they did just good. P- they just picked up some guys they yeah. liked. Honestly, they did good. Yeah, but they didn't make me like upset. <laughs> um, any other draft takeaways before we go to the NBA playoffs to wrap this up? Um, I don't know if I have just like a overall thing for the draft. It was it was all right. It seemed like it went quicker yeah. to me than the last few years. It didn't drag on to me. Oh. The one thing that I forgot to mention. How do you feel about Jake Moody being a third round pick Man. as a kicker? Jake Moody and Brad Robbins both got picked in the NFL draft. That is hilarious and cool. Mm-hmm. But San Francisco better hope they have their next like Robbie Gould. Yeah. A guy that's around for a long time and doesn't miss much. Yeah. Jake Moody is a really good kicker, so it's possible. Yeah, it's but pretty wild. They, yeah. <laughs> they also did get Ronnie Robbie Bell in the seventh round. Yeah, they San did. San Francisco. Him too. So. A lot of Michigan guys got taken all over. Yeah, nine guys taken. Go blue. Yeah. All righty. That's the draft. So now we'll see if uh, any other free agent moves happen now after the draft. Uh, This is where the pieces might start falling. Um, We've already seen a couple of veteran uh, running backs get signed. Uh, Latavius Murray went to the Buffalo Bills. But there's still guys like Leonard Fournette, Ezekiel Elliott that are, you know, still out there. There's still a lot of talk about Dalvin Cook. Who knows? Um, so a lot of the puzzle pieces will, will start falling now that the draft is over, I would assume. Um, NBA playoffs. We're now into the second round. And it's been wild already. So we didn't even talk about the, yeah, the Heat beating the Bucks 4-1 on the night that Giannis came back. And... We did talk about Jimmy Butler scoring 50, but we didn't talk about him getting 42. 56 and 42 back-to-back games. With 14 in the fourth quarter and the game-winning bucket. Uh, and, a, and an unbelievable kind of lucky shot to get them into OT. Yeah. Where he pushed off and made a follow, falling away layup. Mm-hmm. It was wild. Yeah. Um, we also watched the Knicks knock off the Cavs 4-1, to one, which was exciting for me because uh, I like the Knicks. Um, the Grizzlies kind of bounced back for a second against the Lakers, and then they got dusted by the Lakers after that. And the Warriors and Kings went to seven games because Steph Curry put on a show. Um, what is going on with this? So, yeah, it was last Wednesday that Curry put up 31, went to game six. Um, And then in game six, 
The Kings bounced back, kind of beat the Warriors pretty easily. Malik Monk had 28, forced him to a Game 7. And then in Game 7, Steph Curry just said no. Steph Curry had 50 points. Um, he had his most field goal attempts ever 38 with 38. Yeah. Um, he shot pretty efficiently, and they won handily 120 over 100. Sacramento had a great, valiant effort, but it was not enough to take on this dynasty. Um, Celtics took care of the Hawks uh, in six games, so they moved on. They're playing the Sixers, and then trying to recap everything. The Suns took on the Nuggets. Nuggets blew them out in the first game. Uh, Jamal Murray is just playing outstanding the last couple games. He had 34 in game one. And then in game two, the Nuggets won again. A lot much uh, much lower score, 97 to 87. Devin Booker played pretty well. Jamal Murray did not play well, but the Suns couldn't take advantage. Jokic had 39 in that game. 16 so, rebounds. Yeah. So now the Nuggets are up 2-0. And then on Sunday, uh, the Heat and Knicks started game one. And the Heat won that one uh, behind Jimmy Butler, just, you know, 25. Not as good as he has been. <laughs> um, And then on Monday, the Sixers and Celtics started game one. Sixers were without Joel Embiid, and they still won. James Harden scored 45 on the Celtics, who were a defensive team. And... That was even when Jason Tatum had 39. And then when we catch up yesterday, the Knicks bounced back, beat the Heat in game two. Um, more behind Jalen Brunson. He can't hit a three to save his life, but he can hit everything else. And then Lakers-Warriors game one was last night, which was actually really exciting. Um, but Anthony Davis had 30 points, 20 rebounds. Could not be stopped. Steph Curry tried. They made a big comeback. Jordan Poole missed the final shot of the game for the Warriors to uh, tie it up, and he missed. And that's where we're at. So, now that I did a recap, what have you seen so far in the second round? Um, and if you want to touch base on the end of the couple of those first rounds, go ahead. I just wanted to throw out all the records at the moment. <laughs> so, I don't even know which one to start at. I'll start at the one I'm most shocked about so far. Uh, James Harden just turning back into like 2016-17 Houston James Harden. Mm -hmm. Immediately once Joe Allen Bede went out. Yep. I did not expect that he would erupt for 45 and hit the game winning three for them to upset Boston in Boston for game one. Mm -hmm. And now after winning MVP, congratulations to, to Joe Allen Bede. Uh, averaging 33-10. and 10, Honestly, one of the mo best offensive seasons we've seen from a center in our lifetime. Yeah. Uh, there's a little bit of pressure on Boston. Mm hmm Because Joel is coming back, and they're going to be playing with some fire. Yep, and that game is tonight. Yeah, so if Philly goes up 2-0, that would be wild. Mm hmm Really interesting. Getting to go back to Philly. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming Boston will get game two. Boston shot the lights out in game one and still lost. That, that was kind of the demoralizing part I could see for Boston. They honestly played well on offense, but the defense – yeah, they came up short on that end. Yeah. The Denver and Phoenix series, we honestly can we could chalk that up it, for the most part. To me, it's kind of wild, though, because I felt like uh, Phoenix was playing really well going into the series. But, uh, and it's, it's clear that they just don't have a bench. Yeah. They just don't have it. They and, just I, they seem like they are real, which is wild, because I felt like they would have upped their defensive pressure in this series. They are struggling so much. To guard Jamal William or Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic. Listen, do you have, we, we do we need to have a discussion about DeAndre Ayton? Uh, do we need to talk? I didn't want to go there, but do you remember last year when we were saying, well, we we were on the I think on the outside of everybody saying the Pistons should offer him a big contract. Mm -hmm. This is why we were kind of sketchy on the whole thing. Yeah, because he just. He's he's like seven one, mm -hmm. like two fifty five, two sixty, and he plays like a shooting guard, yeah, kind of or a small forward. He just doesn't feel like he's 
He's out. Th- he's just out there. Yeah. <laughs> like he's good for a good like fourteen and eight. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he could give you twenty and ten. But you don't realize he is a top pick. Like he was the number one pick in his draft, twenty sixteen. People forget that almost or seventeen, whichever year, and they've just kind of let it go. But you're right. Like in their last game, Bismack Biombo had two points off the bench. Campaign, we're not. We're not going to talk about Bismack Biombo. Campaign had two points off the bench. Listen, if, that was it. If Booker and KD don't go off, they don't have a chance. Mm-hmm. And they got to figure. So I don't, they're not winning this series. <laughs> they they have things to figure out for next season because CP3 is now out with a groin injury, probably for like the next two or three games. Yeah, I don't see how they could get a win. Maybe if Booker and KD both go for forty in Phoenix, they mm-hmm. could get one. But it's looking like it might be a sweep. Yeah, because Denver. This is the best Denver has looked in a long time. Yep, and they're all healthy at the right yeah, time. They're all fully healthy. They're all coming together and locking in at the same time. Like you said, KCP had a game. Um, Bruce Brown had a game. Yeah, all everybody's contributing, mm-hmm. and they step up when they have to. So I'm I'm loving the way Denver is playing. That fifty point game Steph put up on the road in Sacramento. That was I I I I don't know what more to say about Steph at this point. Yeah. I love him so much as a player. His style his style of play is just incredible. Mm-hmm. Nobody can do it like him. And those thirty eight field goals, that's one of that might be the favorite my favorite game I've seen of Steph Curry. Mm. Because that's not the type of player he is. Yeah. He doesn't have those Kobe or Jordan or whatever player you think of that takes those amounts of shots. Yeah, he's usually just like hyper-efficient or a lot of threes. This is the game where, like you said, he he said this is it. Mm -hmm. I'm unloading the clip and I'm winning us this game. Yeah. 20 of 38 for 50 points, 7 of 18 threes. Mm Mm-hmm. Huge game for a legendary player. And they still have not lost a Western Conference Series since 2014. That's 19 straight if you're Incredible. Counting. Incredible. Um, but they are down 0-1 against the Lakers. But uh, I wouldn't count them out yet. Yeah, I, I honestly, I can only say so much about this game because I I fell asleep before it even started. Yeah. I watched some highlights. Yeah, it Clay, was a good game. Steph, and Jordan Poole hit six threes. Yeah, a piece. And the Lakers hit six threes as a team. Yeah. And the Lakers won. Well, you want to know what the uh, discrepancy everybody's talking about. Free throws? Free throws. The Lakers <laughs> shot 29 free throws. They made 25, so they were very good at making their free throws. Um, the Warriors, 5 of 6. But when you shoot over 53s yeah. and the Lakers shoot 25, which means they're primarily driving to the rim, mm-hmm. the Lakers are going to get more free throw attempts. Like, yeah. To me, that's just logic. Yeah, fair enough. Like it, yeah, but yeah, AD had twenty three and eleven in the first half, finished with thirty and twenty three. Mm-hmm. Biggest game from a Lakers big man since Shaquille O'Neal. That's yeah. the type of stuff they expect from AD in these games. Mm-hmm. And Kevon Looney also had twenty three rebounds. He's been absolutely averaging, insane. He's been averaging almost twenty rebounds. <laughs> Two a bigs game. both had twenty three rebounds in a game. Is yeah, yeah. But yeah, Gold Golden State has to go back to the drawing board. Yep. I saw in a lot of instances the Lakers had LeBron playing off ball and like mm-hmm. driving to the rim. Yeah. And the Warriors seemed kind of caught off guard by that, so they have to adjust. Mm-hmm. Draymond Green said something about him in his uh post game podcast. Yeah. But- Dennis Dennis Schroeder actually did a really good job on Steph Curry um at times. Um they also used uh Jared Vanderbilt a lot on Steph Curry. I think the Warriors just need to make a little uh defensive adjustment on how they're going to guard Anthony Davis. I know that's a tall task, but um, do a couple things differently for them, and I think they should be just fine. But at the same time, you're probably not going to get six threes from your best three-point shooters every game. Yeah. So we saw some really good defense from the Warriors at the end of the game, but they're going to need to keep it up consistently. Yeah, and then the Heat and Knicks series. That's a fun one. Two teams nobody Listen, really expected. I, I've, I've been behind Jimmy for some years now. It is amazing to see my dedication to this man. The dudes are starting to get paid because he's he turns into a legend when it's playoff time, mm. and that's why I, I that's why I'm such a big fan. Oh, they don't play till Saturday. Dang, that's crazy. But when it's time to go to a completely different level, Jimmy is one of the few people that can really do it. Mm-hmm. Like we said, fifty six and forty two in the closeout games to beat Milwaukee. 
he had what was it, twenty five and eleven in game one against yeah. the Knicks. Yeah, they they upset the Knicks, kind of an upset against the Knicks just because of seeding. Yeah, but Miami has four or five guys that have all been here, and yeah. the Knicks are in a brand new situation. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't surprised that Miami pulled out game one. And in game two, Jimmy, Jimmy Butler didn't, play. didn't even play. Miami was in it for most of the game. Mm-hmm. They still were able to tough it out, but. Their role guys played really well, yeah, like Caleb Martin. You, you said Jalen Brunson doesn't hit threes often. Hey, when he heats up, yeah, it's hard to beat the Knicks when Jalen Brunson heats up from three, and he went six of ten in this one. Mm-hmm. He had the Garden rocking. Yep, and ever since, and basically R.J. Barrett is going through, um, basically the same scenario that you had with um, Kenny Pickett. You Let's call see. him out, and they go off. Art, he is doing everything he can you to make all the haters eat their words. You basically said you couldn't trust R.J. Barrett and you didn't know what happened to his basketball game. He heard you loud and clear. He's Listen, been playing pretty he, good. He started attacking the rim, and his him attacking balances out his game. And he's hitting jumpers, too. Mm-hmm. Like he had he, five threes. He is getting good shots, and he's playing with confidence. Mm-hmm. And he still doesn't have a ton of game, to be honest. But when he drives, he is, he's quick off the dribble. And when he gets to the rim, he gets fouled. He he can finish well, mm-hmm. and he's hitting his jumper. So I I can't really complain. Yeah, Josh Hart almost had a triple double as well in this game. Man, he he is like the heart of that team. Mm-hmm. He is a true New York Nick. Yeah, it that that's kind of a that series Heat Knicks and Lakers Warriors are my two favorite series at the moment. I agree. Um, both of those I kind of hope maybe go seven. I don't know. I don't. I guess I don't want the Warriors to go to seven because I don't want the chance that the Lakers could win a game seven or something like that. Yeah. So we got one game tonight. Just yeah. one. Sixers, Sixers Celtics, Celtics game two. Mm-hmm. With Embiid back, like we said, if the Sixers win this game, uh, they might just be in the Eastern Conference Finals. Hey, Liz, I I don't know. We do, we do you know who Doc Rivers is? You know who that coach is? Yeah. Have you seen him blow leads in the playoffs before? Yeah. Blow we, series. We also know how James Harden awesome. is in closeout games. So. Yeah. But they have the MVP. If they go up 2-0, I have n- zero confidence <laughs> that they're just going to run through. Yeah. I have zero confidence. But it would be funny if they do make the Eastern Conference Finals because I think this trust the process has been a lot longer than they thought. <laughs> like probably double the years. All righty. Well, that's uh, everything. We're caught back up. So um, next week. More playoffs, um, any NFL news that comes up, any college news that comes up. We're starting to get closer to that free roam uh, part of the season where we can kind of just talk about whatever we want. Um, so we'll see what we come up with uh, for the future weeks and as we get into the summer. But uh, this has been Bruce from the Sidelines, and we'll see you guys next time. I'm really not happy with the Cowboys. Even with the whole emotion. Just take that star off his helmet.